Yun. Is it visible now? Okay. So, in this next 40, 30 to 40 minutes, I will be covering this topic of uh, host virus interactions under these headings. History of viruses, nature of viruses, origin of viruses, general properties of viruses, viral pathogenesis, course of viral infections, and outcome of viral infections, and host response. I thought it is relevant to speak something about the virus itself, because there are, in this group, other uh, non-microbiologists are there for whom the basic knowledge of the virus is uh, pertinent. So with this uh, idea in mind, let me start off my talk, talking about uh, the how, what human infections are associated with uh, viruses. There are what certain uh, fatal diseases which are caused by those viruses, like the smallpox, which is now, of course, extinct, poliomyelitis, which is also under, uh, eradicated now, rabies, hepatitis, hemorrhagic fevers, and encephalitis, particularly the arbovirus encephalitis. These are the few viruses, uh, diseases of examples which be fatal, including we can now can put this COVID-19, which is also a fatal infection, though the mortality is not that high. Then you have highly contagious uh, infections like influenza, common cold, measles, mumps, chickenpox, like that. Viruses also cause congenital anomalies like uh, the rubella virus and the cytomegalovirus. And then there are three human viruses which are have evidenced association with uh, cancers, particularly the hepatitis B virus, human papillomavirus, and Epstein-Barr virus. In addition to all this, viruses provide the simplest model systems for many of the basic problems in biology. It's easy to manipulate them. They have a very simple uh, structure without any cellular organelles and easy to manipulate. That way, it becomes the ideal tool for molecular biology works. Going back to some history about these viruses, the existence of viruses was realized during the closing years of 19th century. In 1892, it was Ivanovsky recorded the transmission of TME by bacteria-free suspensions. In 1898, Loeffler and Frosch described the foot and mouth disease virus. And 1898, Vegerific considered the agents of bacteria-free filtrate to be living, but fluid and coined the term virus, which literally means poison. In 1911, Roos described the virus causing malignant tumors in chicken. In 1914, it was Todd D. who described the bacteriophage and its uh, st structure. Next 25 years saw uh, extensive research in molecular structure, clinical applications, and pathogens of viruses. And in 1935, Stanley crystallized the tobacco mosaic virus and showed it to be made up of DNA and proteins. In 1942 or 1940, the arrival of electron microscope permitted the visualization of these viruses. The viruses are a heterogeneous class of agents varying in shape, size, chemical composition, host range, etc. All have genomic either DNA or RNA covered by a protein shell and multiply only inside the cells. They are also called as parasites at the genetic level. In essence, viruses are nucleic acid molecules that replicate. There's always a controversy to, whether to consider the viruses as living organisms or lifeless arrangement of molecules, as Dr. Ramesh was earlier telling, whether they are uh, non-living. Outside the cells, they are just macromolecules. Therefore, viruses can be said to possess some attributes of life and they are not living organisms. The terms living and dead are irrelevant as far as viruses are concerned. Better to use functionally active or inactive or infective or non-infective. If they are infective, we can call, consider them as uh, living or... This uh, slide shows how the other microorganisms can be compared with the viruses. We have bacteria, the mycoplasma, the rickettsia, and the chlamydia. Chlamydia, like viruses, are also obligate intracellular parasites but there are some differences. 
between all these. As can be seen here, cellular organization seen in bacteria, affect mycoplasma, rickettsia, and chlamydia. But viruses do not have any cellular organization of their own. Growth on inanimate media, all of them grow except viruses. Binary fission is the type of replication seen in bacteria, mycoplasma, rickettsia, and chlamydia. But viruses undergo a complicated uh, replicative cycle within the cells, and there is nothing like binary fission. Coming to the nuclear acid content, both DNA and RNA is found in all these uh, eukaryotic cells, that is uh, bacteria, mycoplasma, rickettsia, and chlamydia. But in viruses, you will have either DNA or RNA as their genomic content. Coming to the sensitivity for antibiotics, viruses are resistant to most of the antibacterial antibiotics, though they, they themselves are susceptible to antiviral antibiotics. Coming to the interferon sensitivity, only viruses are susceptible to interferons, whereas all these three, uh, four are not sensitive to interferons. So this is the basic uh, salient differences between the, the microorganisms other than viruses and the viruses per se. The origin of viruses is exactly not known. And it's possible that RNA and DNA viruses have different origins. There are two theories which are uh, propounded. One is, one is the, the viruses are derived from DNA or RNA components of host cells. Or second is the degenerate forms of intracellular parasites. It is always as uh, a classification of any organism a group of organisms is essential to study them in a systematic way so viruses are classified based on their uh, systemic uh, classification their dna content rna content all that that is based on the morphology genome structure study further uh, strategies for replication is also considered and uh, we have a broad group of dna viruses and rna viruses and within rna viruses we have single standard or double standard and in DNA also, we had single studded double or double studded DNA virus. Nearly 4,000 animal and plant viruses are put into 56 families, out of which 24 cause human infections. And uh, second classification that we do in the medical field is based on symptomatology, which is more practical for us. So we have viruses causing respiratory infection, viruses causing uh, central nervous system infections, like that we have uh, based on symptomatology. But I will not go into the details of all that because not uh, relevant at, for this particular talk, I suppose. This is the generalized, uh, the uh, symptomatology based classification, generalized disease, smallpox, rubella, yellow fever, measles, CNS, polio, aseptic meningitis, rabies, respiratory disease, influenza, parainfluenza, RSV. We can also include the coronavirus of the present day interest, skin and mucous membrane. Uh, herpes simplex virus 1, molluscum contagiosum, and warts. Eye infections, adeno, Newcastle, liver, hepatitis A virus, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, salivary gland virus infections caused by mumps and CME, and gastrointestinal tract virus infections caused by rota and norwalk. This is a classification that we really uh, like to do in uh, medical virology because it's much more practical for us, as I said. Coming to some basic uh, general properties of viruses, as I already said, they are obligate intracellular parasites. They contain only one type of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA. No cellular organization. They lack enzymes necessary for protein and no nucleic acid synthesis and depend on the host cell machinery for replication. Cause a large number of human diseases ranging from minor ailments like common cold to terrifying diseases like uh, rabies, HIV, and COVID-19 also. Coming to the morphology, they are much smaller than bacteria. They are filterable agents, can pass through filters that can hold back bacteria. Their size varies from 20 nanometers to 300 nanometers. That is, uh, parvovirus is smallest, and pox virus is the largest. And uh, virion is the term used for extracellular infectious virus particle, single particle. This slide shows the comparative uh, size range of different viruses. As we can see here, Corona comes everywhere between the smallest and the largest. There is about uh, 
So compared to this E. coli, you can see how minute these viruses are and uh, they pass through most of the filters meant for bacteria. Morphologically, the virus will have a nucleocapsid which contains the nucleic acid and a proteinaceous cover, the capsule, and an envelope. Envelope may be there, may not be there in some viruses. And projecting from the envelope, we have the peplomers, which are finger-like projections. And uh, these are the ones which really come into the act, come to act to enter the host cells. The nucleic acid and the capsid with or without envelope forms the complete virus particle. Capsid itself is a protein coat surrounding the nucleic acid core. It protects the nucleic acid from inactivation, helps to introduce viral genome into the host cell. And capsomeres are the building blocks of these capsid, repeating protein units that make up the capsid. And protomers are polypeptide chains which make the capsomere also. So this is how the capsid is organized, proteins. The protomers are there which will get organized into the capsomere and then the capsid probe capsid and the mature capsid. The envelope is a very important structure for a virus, but it may be present, it may not be present. It is always derived from the host cell membrane. It's lipoprotein in nature. Lipid is of host cell origin, while the protein is from the virus. The protein subunits seen as projecting spikes on the surface of envelope are called the peplomers. As I already said, they form the organs of attachment to the host cell. The virus may have more than one type of peplomer as seen in influenza viruses and they confer chemical, antigenic and biological properties to the virus, these envelopes. Most important thing we should remember is these envelopes are susceptible to lipid solvents and particularly the alcohol based uh, solvents and uh, they can may inactivate the virus also. So this is the comparison between the naked virus and enveloped virus. Here we have the on the left naked virus, which contains only the nucleic acid and the capsid around it. Whereas you have here the enveloped virus with the nucleic acid plus the envelope. And with this peplomers projecting out from the envelope. So an enveloped virus, the complete variant particle contains the nucleic nucleo capsid plus the envelope. Whereas a complete variant in a non in a naked virus, it's only the nucleic capsid. Coming to the resistance of these viruses to the heat and chemical agents, they are highly heat labile, but stable at low temperatures. In seconds, they are inactivated at 56 degrees centigrade, but can be kept frozen at minus 70 for long-term usage. They are also inactivated by sunlight, ultraviolet rays and ionizing radiations, more resistant than bacteria to chemical disinfectants. Most active antiviral agents, that is virucidal oxidizing agents like hydrogen peroxide, potassium permanganate, and hypochlorides. The replication has the following steps. I'll not go into the details. Absorption and attachment, penetration, uncoating, biosynthesis, maturation, maturation and assembly, and release. So in all these processes, the actually the virus uh, sabotages the host cell enzyme mechanisms and utilizes them for their own purpose. A viral hemagglutination is an important property of many viruses. It is uh, seen only with uh, influenza virus. First, it was observed in uh, 1941. It's a convenient method of detection and assay of influenza virus. It is due to the presence of hemagglutinin spikes on the surface of the virus. The hemagglutinin can be reversed by uh, what is called the receptor destroying enzyme or neuraminidase. And uh, it, destruction of the receptor reversal, hemagglutinin, release of the virus from the red cell surface. This is found particularly in mixoviruses. As I said, viruses do not grow on inanimate medium. So, what are the alternatives for us? We have to use either an embryonated uh, egg, where its roots are there. Coriolanthic membrane, allantoic cavity, amniotic cavity, or the yolk sac. Or we can use 
cell lines, which can be of three types, primary, diploid or secondary, and continuous cell lines. Animals like suckling mice are highly susceptible to viruses, and they have been used in virus culture. The viral pathogenesis is a process by which viral infection leads to disease. Majority of the viral infections are subclinical. 90% of the viral infections are subclinical. The consequences of viral infections depend on the interplay between number of viral and host factors. What are the steps in the viral pathogenesis? First is first virus has to first enter into the host cells and show a primary replication and then spread within the human body and this spread depends upon the cell tropism and then it produces cellular injury which results in clinical illness and recovery from infection viral clearance or persistence and then finally viral shedding viral entry various viruses I enter through different routes, particularly skin. We have uh, it may be through the cuts or abrasions or animal bites, like we have uh, herpes simplex virus, and then rabies virus, which enters through the bite of an animal. And respiratory tract entry is seen with influenza viruses, para influenza viruses, and these coronaviruses. Gastrointestinal tract, rotavirus poliovirus and there is some evidence to show that some coronavirus also can enter the host to the gastrointestinal tract. Conjunctiva and mucous membrane again some of the adenoviruses, herpes virus and again coronavirus also can enter to the conjunctival epithelial cells. Genitourinary tract you have the hepatitis B virus and the HIV virus. There are some viruses which can enter directly into the bloodstream by needle injury like hepatitis B virus, HIV blood transfusions like HIV, hepatitis C virus and hepatitis B virus and if through some insect vectors, the arboviruses. So these are the various routes which they can enter. After entering the human system, they show viral uh, replication. Primary replication occurs at the site of an initial entry. The infection remains localized at the site of entry as in influenza virus. They don't spread beyond that uh, respiratory tract or ally and rotavirus or some of the viruses may spread from the local entry site to systemic uh, spread particularly bloodstream like as we seen in herpes zoster virus systemic virus spread many viruses produce disease at sites distant from the point of entry after primary replication they spread via blood neurons or lymphatics to other organs the presence of virus in the blood is called viremia. It's a clinical term and uh, after the replication of the local site, if they enter the blood, it results in what is called a viremia. And most of the viral infection, the clinical onset of the disease coincides with the onset of the viremia. The viral spread to a further organs can be is determined by the organ and cell specificity or what is called cell tropism. And this cell tropism is because of the specific receptors that the virus seek as we seen in case of our coronaviruses we have the ngs and tensin uh, acv2 so receptors are uh, the specific receptors for this coronavirus and they target particularly the respiratory epithelium then the secondary application takes place at susceptible organs and tissues following the systemic spread that may be either in the liver and the lungs as in case of our coronaviruses. Cells can respond to viral infection the following ways. No apparent change. There may not be any change or there may be a cell death or lysis as it's seen in uh, polioviruses. The viral infection can result in cellular proliferation like it happens in Malacoscum contagiosum or they can bring about a transformation of the cells into malignancy like we have in uh, oncogenic viruses. The cytopathic effect is seen only in the tissue culture. It's not seen in the uh, in, in vivo. So the mechanism of viral cytopathogenesis can be uh, 
because of these following events. One is inhibition of cellular protein synthesis, as seen in case of polio viruses, herpes simplex, pox viruses, and Togo viruses. Whereas herpes viruses, which are DNA viruses, they bring about inhibition and degradation of the DNA, resulting in cytolysis. Then the examples like herpes simplex, HIV, varicella zoster, paramyxoviruses, they produce what is called synsatia, that is multinucleated giant cells, which are the cause for the tissue injury. Some of the viruses produce inclusion bodies, which can be either intracytoplasmic or intranuclear, and they can be also causing the pathology. That is particularly with reference to rabies, adenoviruses, pox viruses, rheoviruses, and cytomegaloviruses. What is the outcome of a viral infection? The clinical outcome can be subclinical or inapparent or clinical apparent infections. Clinical infections can be acute infection, which can result in complete recovery as it happens in most of the viral infections. Recovery with residual effects like acute viral encephalitis leading to neurological sequelae, or it can re acute in infection can result in chronic infection, result what is called latency. Chronic infection can be silent or subclinical infection for life, like example cytomegalovirus and Epstein Barr virus. A long silent period before the disease, like HIV and SSPE and reactivation to cause the acute disease like it happens in herpes and shingles that we'll see later again and chronic disease with relapses and exasperations like hepatitis b virus hepatitis c virus and it can result in cancers like we have already seen epstein bauer virus hdlb1 human papilloma virus hepatitis b virus hepatitis c virus and human herpes virus 8. now the two examples, if you take the of local infection, systemic infection, you'll take the examples of the rhinovirus and measles. State of pathology for the viral uh, rhinovirus is portal of entry. Only at the portal of entry, it produces the pathology, that is common cold. Whereas measles, it produces, though it enters through the respiratory tract, it produces lesions in the skin. So it's a distant site. Incubation period is naturally it is short in case of uh, rhinovirus, whereas it is relatively long, where it has to first replicate the entry site, then multiply, cause viremia, and finally at the in the skin it has to multiply. So it has got a relatively long incubation period. Viremia is usually absent in uh, local infections like uh, common cold or rhinovirus infections. Virus viremia is a constant feature of systemic infections like measles. Duration of immunity, variable, may be very short also in case of uh, local infection. Usually, systemic infection, viral infections produce lifelong immunity. One attack of measles will produce uh, what is called sterilizing immunity. The role of IgI is usually very important in case of local infections, usually not important in case of systemic infections. The viral shedding is the last stage in the pathogenesis of the viral infections. The virus, for the virus itself, it is necessary step to maintain its uh, progeny in the population and usually occurs from the site of entry. Occurs at different stages of the disease depending upon the agent. Represents the time at which the, an infected individual is infectious to contacts. In certain cases, shedding does not occur, as in case of rabies. Now, the host, mammalian host responds to the viral infection in two different ways, immunological and non-immunological response. Immunological response is humoral as well as cell-mediated immune response. Humoral response protects the host against reinfection by producing antibodies like IgG and IgM, both in the tissues and the blood, and IgA at the mucosal surfaces of respiratory and gastrointestinal tract, and neutralizing antibodies prevent initiation of a reinfection. Whereas the cellular response is the key factor in recovery from viral infection, and they destroy the viral infected cells. And it is 
the cellular response which gives the lifelong protection for uh, any particular viral infection. And also, cellular response is the one which helps in the recovery from viral infection. Though antibodies can be there in circulating blood, they may prevent, uh, they may neutralize the anti uh, viral circulating virus, but final recovery depends on the uh, active uh, T cell response, which is of very important. Then we have non-specific uh, host responses to viral infection, like phagocytosis, like many other uh, uh, foreign antibody, uh, foreign uh, antigens. Fever is one of the most uh, uh, inhibitory factors for the viruses because an increase in temperature can bring about uh, less or uh, bring down the replication cycle of the virus itself. Hormones like corticosteroids enhance most of the viral infections and uh, pre-existing malnourished, malnourishment can give higher incidence of complications and fatality rates. And age is an important uh, factor. The extremes of age make a person highly susceptible to viral infections. Then among the non-specific responses, interferons are the most important antiviral uh, uh, arm of a human uh, system because these anti interferons can produce some sort of a immunity or a resistance of the non-infected cells these are antiviral substances produced by viral infected cells makes the neighboring cell resistant to viral infection they do not have any direct effect on the viruses it is the host cell specific protein on exposure to interferon the host cells produce a protein which is nothing but a translation inhibiting protein, which inhibits the translation of viral messenger RNA. Then coming to the last uh, section of this uh, talk, the viral persistence. Majority of the viral infections are cleared, but certain viruses may cause persistent infections. And there are two types of persistent infections, chronic infections. Virus is continuously detected, but at low levels, like it happens in case of uh, HIV virus and cytomegalovirus. Whereas latent infections are those, the virus remain completely latent following primary infections, as it happens in uh, herpes simplex virus or varicella zoster virus. Intermittent flare ups of the disease can occur. So, this slide shows how the herpes simplex virus and uh, varicella zoster virus, after primary infection, they get uh, they get. Uh, get hiding into this uh, post, the neural dorsal rotor ganglion and on any reactivation which can be either in the form this is the varicella zoster virus which initially causes chicken pox and post primary the virus hides in these uh, dorsal rotor ganglion cells and any reactivation can result in what is called the shingles in the same way the Herpes simplex virus, you have the, uh, again, they get hiding into this uh, posterior rotal ganglion and any stress like age, X-ray radiation or fever can bring about activation and produce singles or cold sore as it is called, which can be either sunlight or menstruation, even uh, nerve section at the site of entry. This is the how a latent C of the virus can be activated and bring about a, a recurrent infection. So this is my last slide. I hope I have given a, a broad eye view of uh, bird's view eye view of the whole uh, viruses and virus pathogenesis. And uh, mine is only beginning. I'm sure uh, uh, my next speaker, who is my good friend, Srinivas Kumar, will uh, highlight the present uh, pandemic. And what I have done is only the old roots. He will bring about the Hosa Chigro. That is the new things. So with this, I end my talk. And uh, if there are questions, you can put it on the chat box. I'll be happy to clarify. You. Thank you all.
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Questions will be raised on the last part of the session after completing the second speaker. Now I request Dr. Kiran to thank the speaker. Over to you. A very good afternoon to all participants. I, Dr. Kiran B, on behalf of organizing committee, Department of Life Sciences, entire fraternity of Mahajana Education Society, and my own behalf, it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks to Dr. B. N. Harish, former head, Department of Microbiology, Jawal Haralal Nehru, sorry, Jawal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, Puducherry, who has spared his pre precious time for us and delivered a talk on virus host interaction. He took the event to the higher level by his enlightening lecture. He clearly emphasized and described history of viruses, nature of viruses, origin of viruses, general properties of viruses, viral pathogenesis, courses of viral infection, viral diseases, host responses, and viral persistence. Sir, it was a great pleasure to have you among us as a speaker in the today's webinar. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Now we'll start with the second speaker, Dr. Srinivas N. Kumar. Now it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Srinivas N. Kumar. Dr. Srinivas N. Kumar obtained his MBBS degree from Mysore Medical College in the year 1981 and is MD from Jipmer, Puducherry, in the field of clinical microbiology in 1984. Further, Sir pursued his PhD in the field of microbiology at Buffalo, New York, and further. He pursued his postdoctoral training in the field of HIV molecular virology from 91 to 96. To mention some of his honors and awards, Sir received Ernest Wilensky Memorial Award for proficiency in microbiology. Sir also received American Foundation for AIDS Research Scholar Award to his credit. To mention about his appointments, Sir served as lecturer in the Department of Microbiology, Kidwa Institute of Oncology, Bangalore in 85. Then Sir worked as research assistant in the Division of Infectious Diseases, Children Hospital of Buffalo, New York. Further, Sir pursued his postdoctoral research associate in Hammers called Relish Lab, USA. Then Sir joined as assistant scientist, Department of Medicine, University of Wisconsin, Madison, USA. Further, Sir served as research assistant professor, Department of Medicine Division of Hematology, Vanderbilt University, USA. Then Sir joined as research associate professor from the Department of Internal Medicine, St. Louis University, USA. Dr. Srinivas Sen Kumar is member of several association. To mention a few of them, Sir is a member of ad hoc committee member of NIA State Discovery and Development of Therapeutic Study Session. Sir is a member of Human Gene Transfer Advisory Group, Vanderbilt University. Sir is also 
a member proposal reviewer of research planning committee internal study section st louis university he is also a manuscript reviewer of molecular therapy aids research and therapy retrovirology sir has published several research articles in peer reviewed international journals more than 20 to 30 journals he has also written book chapters one is hiv vector system another one packaging cell system for lentivirus vectors sir has presented many research papers and attended several scientific meetings throughout the globe dr shrinivas has also given several invited talks sir is involved in teaching the graduates students with various topics specifically teaching in induced pluripotent stem cells gene therapy viral vector and gene therapy he has also guided several student in the project work sir has received many research grants both intramural and extramurally sir is principal investigator for an intramural project genomic engineered induced pluripotent stem cells for cell therapy funded by cancer center sir is also co investigator for the project directed differentiation of induced pluripotent stem cells in hematopoietic stem cells which is funded by st louis university dr shrinivas is also pi for extramural project funded by nih ron to mention a few of them evaluation of rna transport element in hiv one vector factors affecting gene therapy delivery and expression of hiv one vector protein interactions during hiv assembly and also co investigator for extramural project funded by nih to mention few of them stem cell gene therapy for canine hemophilia idinoridase gene transfer into hemopoietic stem cells and many more with this introduction i request dr shrinivas n kumar to take over the session i welcome you sir thank you dr harish and thank you, thank you dr b n harish for that wonderful introduction for uh, into viruses and virus of cell interactions um i'll share my screen and start my presentation can people um see my slides okay uh the title of my talk is a tale of two pandemics um hiv aids versus covid-19 so the question comes why did they choose this topic so in 1980 i was uh, uh doing my residency or inter or uh, i was an intern in mysore medical college at that same time um far away in uh, los angeles california some uh, new diseases were described in uh, gay men which was the aids epidemic was just starting to occur and i knew nothing about this while i was in doing my uh, internship in mysore medical college uh then later on as dr harish gave this uh, big introduction about what i did with my career I moved to the United States and I worked there for about almost 40 years. And then I am just finished with my academic uh, career at St. Louis University and then a new pandemic began. So my scientific career is sandwiched between these two pandemics. And I have a little bit of experience in virology and I thought I will use that to compare these two pandemics and what we can learn from one to apply to the other
So my talk is structured as follows. Um, I'll give a few slides of, uh, on the history of major pandemics, and then I'll compare the HIV AIDS pandemic to that of COVID-19. And we'll just look briefly at the timeline of discovery of these uh, viruses once the pandemic began and timeline of discovery of drugs for treatment. Then we'll go into details of the molecular virology of both of these viruses, because if you know the details of how they replicate, then you can devise strategies to um, control them. And finally, what I want to stress is I was just struck by how rapidly this COVID-19 virus was uh, discovered and all its properties defined in remarkably short time. So that's what caused me to try and compare the two viruses. So just a brief uh, definition to, before we begin this uh, talk. One is, um, what do we mean by all these terms, pandemic, epidemics, and endemic? So endemic refers to the constant presence of a, or prevalence of a disease in a population within a geographic area. Epidemic refers to an increase, which is often sudden in the number of cases of a disease above what is normally expected in that population. Pandemic refers to even greater spread of the disease. It refers to an epidemic that has spread over several countries or continents and affects large number of people. And, and this is, uh, this is what people have seen with COVID-19. It started in one little place uh, in China, in the Hubei province, and then spread all over the world. And this is uh, due to people traveling from one place to another because international travel has become very common. So we can expect other emerging viruses to also easily spread because of this uh, feature of uh, international travel. So the humankind has experienced pandemics for a very long time. And these are um, some of the pandemics that we have experienced that have been recorded in our history. So Antonine plague happened in 165 to 180 uh, CE or what we used to call AD. Uh, previously, and this was uh, the causative agent is suspected to be either measles or smallpox. It's not known. And then as you go down to the present, there are some important uh, pandemic events. There was the Black Death or bubonic plague, where a lot of people died, 200 million people died, and continues on to the present where we have uh, in the last century, uh, we had um, the Spanish flu, which killed a lot of people. That's about 40 to 50 million people between 1918 and 1990. And followed that by the AIDS pandemic, which began in 1981 and it still continues to today. And it has uh, killed more than 30 million people so far. And then we have several coronavirus uh, pandemics. There was a SARS uh, pandemic between 2002 and 2003. About 770 people died in that one. And then we had the Ebola, uh, which is not a coronavirus, but a different virus that killed about 11,000 people. And then we had the Middle East, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. This is another coronavirus which killed 850 people. And the COVID, which is still ongoing, uh, it has infected more than 21 million people. And uh, as of a uh, few days ago, more than 776,000 people died. This is a different way to represent the same information, but shows which the size of the virus graphically shows 
how many people die due to that virus or uh, uh, bacterial agent. So bubonic plague, which is due to a bacteria. So that took the largest number of casualties. But for today's talk, we'll just look at two of these. One is HIV AIDS and then the COVID-19. So HIV AIDS, uh, the syndrome, as I said, was uh, first observed in 1981. Uh, and then the causative agent uh, isolation took several years. They were able to grow the, they didn't know how to grow this particular virus, this uh, human Im immunodeficiency virus in cells until they figured out you need certain uh, cytokines like uh, interleukin-2 to grow it in uh, cells. So that took a while. And then, then study of uh, stored serum samples showed that uh, the virus that causes AIDS, that is HIV-1, uh, was found as far as 1959 in Bantu males in Africa. And then in 1985, the sequence of HIV was uh, reported. It took a long time to seek um, high degree of variability. That's one of the reasons why we don't have a good vaccine also against this virus. Then the first uh, drug for this virus was uh, discovered about five years uh, later after discovery, which is remarkable for those days. And this was a reverse transcriptase inhibitor called azidothymidine or, or commercially known as zidobudine. So it interferes with replication of the virus. Uh, as mentioned, there are many people living uh, with this uh, virus even today because, because of the drugs that have been discovered, you can live your full life pretty much but still having the virus in your body. If you stop taking the drug, the virus comes back. Uh, but there are more than uh, a dozen million, 12 million people who are not able to afford these drugs. So as a result of that, if you're not taking the drug, you can spread the virus to other people. And last year, about uh, one and a half million people were infected. There were new infections of HIV. And this uh, works out to about uh, 4,600 people getting infected per day. Over the course of these 40 years, more, more than uh, 30 million people have died due to this virus. And in 2019 alone, 690,000 people died. The SARS virus, SARS coronavirus, which is called SARS-CoV-2, is a causative agent of COVID-19. The first case retrospectively or has been or was thought to have occurred on December 1st of 2019. But all the papers that we are going to talk about, they these authors saw the cases only around the second or third week of December. And the virus was isolated within three to four weeks and reported uh, the papers were submitted in January and it was published on February 3rd. This publication of uh, the finding of a new virus coincided with the, even the sequence of the whole virus, which was published even before it was published formally. It was announced to the scientific community through social media and deposited in databases on January 10th. So this was the remarkable speed with which the virus was identified and its sequence determined. There are now very many sequences from different patients throughout the world. I know for a fact one of our colleagues in Bangalore uh, from Nimans, Dr. Uh, Ravi, uh, he had sequenced 20 uh, isolates of this coronavirus already. This virus is generally less susceptible for mutations, but since the RNA virus, it does undergo mutations, and most of it is uh, to this 
spike or envelope glycoprotein that Dr. Harish talked about. There already we have a drug that was tried or developed for a different coronavirus called MERS. And that drug was shown to be effective in an animal model with the new coronavirus. Its efficacy in humans is still being evaluated. Some studies show it has a good effect and it reduces uh, the disease of clinical signs and symptoms and patients recover faster. Other studies do not show this. Already in eight months, 21 million people have been infected. That corresponds to about 260 thousand people get infected every day with this virus. It spreads quite readily. And we have had a big casualty. We have 776,000 people dead from this virus within these eight months. So we have to take this virus seriously, even though the case fatality rate is lower than other coronavirus. So this is just to recount the or recap the history of uh, the detection of uh, HIV. So the AIDS epidemic was first described in New England Journal of Medicine in 1981. They found some uh, pre healthy homosexual men, previously healthy homosexual men, suddenly suffered from diseases which are not seen in people with good immunity. These were uh, diseases produced by uh, parasites that happen in immunodeficient people. So one of them is Pneumocystis carinae. It, is, it used to be thought to be a different, now it has been reclassified. This is a type of fungus infection. This can be present in normal people, but you don't get disease from this, uh, this pathogen. It happens when your immun immunity drops down. The other is the mucosal candidiasis uh, in patients. Again, you will see oral thrush. Uh, this happens in patients with decreased immunity or if you have diabetes, which also produces this. Simultaneously, within a few months, within six months, the CDC Centers for Disease Control in the US also reported unusual cluster of cases of uh, a tumor Kaposi sarcoma, this is of blood vessels, and again, this pneumonia in patients. They provide weekly statistics of ongoing infectious diseases, and they noticed this, observed this in homosexual men. So this happened between 1981 and 1982. In 1983 and 1984, people isolated a virus which was lymphotropic. That means it attacks lymphocytes, particularly T lymphocytes. And they didn't have a name for this virus at that time. They call it lymphotropic retrovirus or lymphocytopathic retrovirus. And uh, Robert Gallo's group, uh, who helped uh, Luc Montaigne in uh, growing this virus, he called it human T cell lymphotropic virus or T cell leukemia virus three, because he had already discovered two other viruses in this group, HTLV1 and 2. So it took quite a while, it took almost four to five years from seeing the disease, growing the virus, and then getting the sequence. So where did uh, the human, human immunodeficiency virus come from? So now we have the sequence from a lot of different isolates, we can see how the viruses are related. Among immunodeficiency viruses, they have, there are viruses which affect just uh, non-human primates. SIV is called simian immunodeficiency virus. And this is present in African green monkey. Other viruses, uh, there's a strain of HIV called HIV-2, a type of uh, type 2 HIV which uh, came from Suti Mangabe, SIV, SMM, SMM stands for Suti Mangabe monkeys. And then we have some of these immunodeficiency viruses present in chimpanzees. This is a uh, semen immunodeficiency CPZ, 
and this got transferred to humans. I believe this, there was multiple times this virus was spread from monkeys to humans. The reason this happened uh, is believed because of people uh, working with these animals and killing these animals for meat, for bush meat. And this transfer has apparently happened three different times and on three different occasions. And we have three different groups of HIV, the N group, the M group, and the O group. All these came from chimpanzee. Now switch to the other pandemic, positive virus of COVID-19. So the disease itself, they said the outbreak happened in December and by January 7th, uh, they had already submitted their papers, January 7th, January 20th, for example. And, it, and these papers describe the description or uh, describe the identification of a new coronavirus that was affecting uh, people in China. So these are the four different papers, uh, important papers. There are others too. So uh, one of the papers on January 24th, which was published, showed that this virus not only spread from uh, animals to humans, but it can also spread from one human to another. So by January 24th, we already knew that the virus could spread from human to human. So this is the Wuhan uh, wet meat and seafood market. And you see there are lots of uh, wild animals which are bred and sold here. And they are, some of the meat is thought to be uh, they are considered delicacies. So you can see the civet cat and you can see snakes and all these animals are sold here. So there's close contact between humans and wild animals and viruses that normally uh, we don't get exposed to, we have a chance to get exposed to when we handle these wild animals. These viruses are uh, in those wild animals and they produce minimal disease sometimes. And they, they may be, they produce chronic infections and we get exposed to them when we handle them and eat their meat. So since these are usually present in animals, how do humans get the coronavirus? Most of the coronavirus that affect humans are present as in bats, bats are the natural reservoirs uh, of this virus. And from bats, they spread to intermediate hosts. And from these intermediate hosts, they gradually adapt for replicating in uh, mammals, and then it can spread to humans. So there was a previous SARS epidemic or uh, that was spread through an intermediate host known as the civet cat. That's called the SARS, that's, that's the SARS-CoV-1, you can call it, but it's just refers to as SARS-CoV, that's the virus, uh, that produced severe acute respiratory syndrome in humans. The next one came from bats and infected dromedary or camels, and from camels, close association, it infected people in, in the Middle East where camels are prevalent and they're used as mode of transportation. Then the other coronaviruses from bats that go through mammals and these, uh, these coronaviruses don't cause the severe disease but they can produce common cold. So this is how from animals this is another zoonotic disease like HIV, which comes from animals. And you can get, look at the phylogenetic tree of the different coronaviruses. And this just shows the relationship of the various groups and subgroups of coronaviruses. We don't need to know details of this, except that most of the coronaviruses of importance to us are in what's called beta coronaviruses. And they have 
different uh, lineages A, B, C, D, and the ones we are talking about today belongs to group B. I think we have covered this already. So the original or the first epidemic with the coronavirus, which produced severe acute respiratory syndrome, is, that is the SARS-CoV virus. It came from the intermediate host called a civet cat, uh, Asian palm civet, it's called. And it spread to other types of uh, civet cats. And then from there, through this uh, wet markets, it affected human beings. But it was in a different province than the Hubei province that we currently have for the COVID-19. And this number of cases only around 8,000 and about 700 to 800 people died from this. So it's about 10% fatality. The MERS-CoV, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, the intermediate host is CAMEL. It infected fewer people, but the fatality rate is 36%. So again, 700 people, approximately 700 to 800 people died from this virus. And these have been, for the most part, controlled. They died out, these, these viruses, but their low levels might be present and they can come back. So we don't know the, what is the intermediate host for SARS-CoV. One study seems to suggest it could be from uh, an antiter type uh, animal. It's called the Malaysian pangolin, which is traded freely from Malaysia to China. And it is sold in these wet meat markets. This disease was recognized in 2019, end of 2019, December. It has already infected over 21 million people. Although it has a low fatality rate, we know more than 700,000 people have died. So one way to look at how infectious a virus is to, is to figure out what is the basic reproductive number. What it means is if an infected individual comes into a population which is naive, that has not experienced the virus, how many other people can this person infect? So if you look at something like measles virus, one person can infect easily 12 to 18 people. So it's very infectious. Well, SARS-CoV is uh, estimated to be about 2.5. One person can in infect two to three people. And the MERS coronavirus is one person may infect another person occasionally. So this easy to, once the this case, reproductive number falls below zero, the disease will, is essentially controlled. It will die out. SARS-CoV, there are conflicting reports, but since it is controlled, it is we already, without doing much, uh, we can say its infectivity is also quite low, or the basic reproductive number. So now we get into the meat of the talk. Let's see how much time I got. I have another half hour. Um, so, we will talk about each of these viruses, the two viruses, the human immunodeficiency virus and SARS-CoV in some depth. Dr. Harish already told you about um, how enveloped viruses look like and this is a cartoon depicting a uh, human immunodeficiency virus. There are specific features of this virus that we need to know to understand how this uh, virus replicates and what we can do to control it. So this is an enveloped virus containing a positive sense RNA genome. So positive sense means it is like mRNA. It can be translated directly on the ribosome if ribosomes are available. So that's what positive sense uh, means. And there are two copies of this positive sense RNA gene. It is deployed. So it's, 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 it's like having two copies of uh, 
uh, one of the autosomes in our body, one from dad and one from mom. But this is in the same virus, it is identical copy generally, but there can be some mutation. It is a member of retroviridae. So retrovirus means it's a virus that goes against the central dogma of molecular biology. The central dogma of molecular biology is we have DNA from which you get RNA and from RNA you get protein. A retrovirus up, upends this dogma. It starts with RNA and then it gets reverse transcribed into DNA for which it has a special enzyme called as reverse transcriptase. So when this enzyme was announced in the Cold Spring Harbor retrovirus meeting, it was a shocking observation to all people there because everybody thought there's only one way gene expression will happen. It goes from DNA to RNA to protein and you cannot go from RNA to DNA. So the discovery of this enzyme by two scientists, Howard Temin and David Baltimore, they both got, got the Nobel Prize. And this reverse transcriptase unleashed all the revolution in molecular biology. Cloning can happen because of reverse transcriptase. So you take RNA and make double-stranded DNA from it and put it in plasmids and now you have a clone. So this is a causative agent of acquired immunity syndrome. And the reason uh, this virus uh, targets host cells is because of the surface glycoproteins. So there are two surface glycoproteins on this virus. Like Harish said, there can be more than one. One is called glycoprotein GP120. This is the molecular weight on the SDS page gels. And then the other subunit of uh, this peplomer, as uh, Dr. Harish referred to, is GP41. So they have distinct function. GP120 binds to its receptor, which is CD4 positive T cells. And these CD4 molecules are present in T lymphocytes and macrophages, for, for example. And in addition to the CD4, uh, the virus also needs a second molecule called a co-receptor. These are chemokine receptors, uh, CCR5 or CXCR4. These are the core, two co-receptors. And we'll go into detail how binding of this to the receptor allows the virus to enter the host cells in subsequent slides. The virus, in addition to this surface uh, molecules, the, which are coded by the virus genome, also had other proteins inside. One is a P17 or matrix protein. And then within it is a capsid that Dr. Harish referred to made up of a protein of molecular weight 24. It's called GAG P24. This is a group specific antigen. And the size of this capsid protein is 24 kilodalton. Within the capsid are the two molecules of RNA. And the virus carries in this capsid the reverse transcriptase and integrase enzymes. So this is important for the virus when it infects a cell, it needs the reverse transcriptase to make the cDNA. So I'm sorry for this slide, it's uh, very tiny, but I like this slide because it uh, describes or uh, depicts the replication of this virus in a very nice way, pertinent for this talk. And this was from a recombinant DNA book that uh, James Watson wrote. So that's another thing about this, uh, this slide and I just scanned it in. <clears throat> so the virus binds to a target cell which has appropriate receptors. And fusion of virus membrane with the target membrane occurs and it releases its contents into the cytoplasm. So the RNA of the virus is then reverse transcribed by the enzyme encoded in that virus and present in the virus capsid. And it will produce a double standard cDNA. The hallmark of this virus is uh, HIV is it can end this, transport this double-stranded cDNA 
into an intact nucleus through the nuclear pore and then it has another enzyme the virus which is called integrase which helps the virus genome to get integrated into the host cell genome so this integrated form of this rna is called a pro virus because it is from this more viruses are produced in the future so once it is integrated into the host chromosome, and this can occur randomly in any of the chromosomes, and then it can use the cellular machinery for its transcription. So RNA polymerase will uh, uh, bind to the promoter of this provirus and synthesize full length RNA. This RNA is then spliced and uh, exits a nucleus to produce several proteins. We are concerned about two proteins, TAT and REV, transcriptional activator and regulator of envelope, REV. These two proteins come back into the nucleus and increase transcription rate and produce an abundant amount of the genome length RNA. And this, this RNA, although it has many exons and introns, is only partially spliced or unspliced, these messages then can exit the nucleus because of the presence of this REV protein. So REV protein modifies the splicing of this RNA in the cell and allows that RNA to exit the nucleus. Once this full length or partially spliced RNA comes into the cytoplasm, it can synthesize the proteins that make the virus particles. So these include the GAG, group specific antigen, the polymerase region, Paul an envelope, all these three components come together with the virus RNA and it exists as a mature virus. This shows a little bit greater detail the, the genome organization of this virus. So all retroviruses have uh, three genes, GAG, call, and envelope, and they also have a protease. So this is just to be, some people want to be very specific to mention the protease, so it is included in this uh, reproduction. So these are the three essential proteins that produce the virus particle, or what are called structural proteins. And then the virus also makes several accessory proteins called WIF, VPR, VPU. The, these are not essential on NAS. These are not essential for this talk, so we won't go into this in great detail. It also uh, makes the codes for two other regulatory proteins, transcriptional activator called TAT, and regulator of envelope or REV. So these are coded in two exons and they come together during uh, the splicing and then they, when they're translated, they produce these two proteins. The early step when the virus first starts doing this, it doesn't have any REV or TAT in the cell. So it produces only what is called completely spliced messages at that stage. Once enough of these REV and TAT molecules accumulate, the, the replication switches to the late stage when there is high amounts of REV. Once this happens, either the full length message or partially spliced message can exit the nucleus, and these can code for GAG, Paul, and envelope, and the V proteins. So this is my attempt at trying to show this in an animated slide. So this is the five prime and three prime long terminal repeats or LTR, which contains the promoter and also a termination signal. So the transcription starts in the five prime LTR and goes all the way across up to the three prime LTR where the polyadenylation signal kicks in and it uh, terminates there. So between these two ends are all these open reading frames, ORFs. And you can see these open reading frames are in different frames. They are not collinear. So the gag is in a different uh, reading frame than pro -pol. And this is, although in the same reading frame, uh, with envelope, this is usually spliced out when you want to make envelope. So let's look at how a gag and call are synthesized. So the TAT protein, which I 
talked about previously binds to an element in the RNA, this transcription or activator, which is called the TAR element, and increases the processivity of the cellular RNA polymerase too, and it makes abundant full length messages. There is a, a structure, RNA structure called REV response element within the envelope coding region. The REV protein binds to this REV response element, and once it is bound, this RNA can be transported to the cytoplasm without undergoing further splicing. Or so this has now exited the nucleus, it is in the cytoplasm, and it can be translated. So it's very, the full end message is translated into two proteins, GAG and PROPOR, although they are in two different reading planes. So this is very tricky and the virus does it in a very clever way. So these are the small and large subunits of the ribosome translating this RNA and it produces GAG sometimes and sometimes it produces gag propop. The only way it can go from one reading frame to another is if the ribosome frame shifts, then it can get into the next reading frame. So we'll see a little bit more of this in the next slide. So at the end of the gag is this string of uh, U's. There are six U's followed by an A. This is called the slippery site. And there is also a secondary structure which helps this ribosome frame shift. So normally uh, when the ribosome gets to the end of GAG, it sees um, these two codons, UUU and UUA. If the tRNAs bind these two and synthesis proceeds in this fashion regularly, then it will form the GAG protein and termination happens. <clears throat> Once in every 10 translations, the ribosomes get confused. Instead of picking these three first use, it slips back one frame and picks one set of triplet of use, another set of triplet of use, and the A gets, gets transferred to the next codon, next couple of nucleotides. So there's a frame shift of minus one. When this happens, then you get what is called gag pop. So it has gone into the Paul reading frame. So here's a full length RNA. These are two different reading frames. Without frame shift, only gag is produced. And if there's a frame shift at the end of gag, minus one nucleotide, then it becomes makes a fusion protein of gag up to here and the Paul up to here. So it becomes a gag Paul protein. The, the reason we are talking about this is this is the same strategy also used by coronaviruses. The, some proteins are expressed by this ribosomal frame shifting. And people are trying to see if they can block this frame shifting to find drugs. But at least we understand at the level how clever the viruses are in trying to code so much information in a small stretch of RNA or DNA genome. Now you can express these viral proteins, GAG and uh, gag Paul in cells, and they will spontaneously assemble into virus-like particles. So initially the particles have this feature. They have uh, their thickened cytoplasmic membrane, it buds, and you get this structure. It's like a donut, but for people in Karnataka, we'll call it kodbale. It looks like kodbale. And if the viral protease in the gag Paul coding frame is actually what is called a polyprotein. And in, within this polyprotein is a protease. The protease self cleaves itself out of this gag Paul protein and then cleaves the gag <clears throat> and the Paul into its constituent subunit. When it does this, it becomes from a coat ballet, it becomes a cone shaped coat. This is a mature virus. Virus without the protease activity is non-infectious. A virus which has an active protease becomes infectious. 
And then here on this budding virus, the very tiny peplomer, it's very hard to see. But in a coronavirus, you'll be able to see this very clearly. So protease is a very good target for drug discovery. And we already have many protease inhibitors to block HIV. And incidentally, even coronaviruses have this similar mechanism. They have a protease and the protease may, uh, cleaves uh, the polyprotein into a constituent subunit. So if we can block this, we can block coronavirus. So briefly describe the various steps of this virus. The virus binds, it fuses with the target membrane. So this may be one point of finding a drug to prevent virus fusion with target cell fusion. Then there is the next step of reverse transcription. So this enzyme is unique to virus and it's not a host protein. So if you find a drug which can specifically target reverse transcriptase, you can block this step of forming the double-stranded uh, DNA from the single-stranded RNA genome. Then the next step is integration. This is also uh, done by a viral protease. I mean, a protein called integrase, and you might be able to find a drug that blocks this step. Finally, you have all the proteins being made, and then to assemble into an infectious virion, you need the viral protease to act. Again, this is unique to the virus, and we can find drugs that target this. So, in fact, we have drugs that target all these different steps now for HIV. And that is why we can practically survive for the full length of our lifespan just by taking this drug constantly every day. So our hope is to use a similar strategy to find drugs for coronavirus. Let's go into little details of uh, one of the steps, that is the fusion step. So I said there are two proteins on HIV. One is the GP120 that binds to CD4 and co-receptor CCR5. And the other is the GP41, 41 kilo Dalton subunit. If you look at this sequence, it has from the N terminus to C terminus in this protein, there is something called a fusion peptide or AFP. This is a hydrophobic and it finds its home best in the lipid bilayer because that is also hydrophobic within the bilayer. And there are two heptad repeats. Heptad means seven amino acids form one repeat, and this is repeated many times within this. And there are two sets of this, heptad repeat one, heptad repeat two, and that is known as HR1, HR2. And the entire peplomer, what Dr. Harish talked about, consists of a trimer of these GP120 and GP41. So once the binding to the cell receptor happens and co-receptor, the GP120 gets out of the way. There's a conformational change. And this GP41, because it has this hydrophobic uh, sequence here, which some people call greasy finger, binds to the host cell membrane. This top one is the host cell membrane. The bottom is the virus membrane. Here, there's a virus here. So once there is a bridge between the host and target membrane, this protein does like what, like a jackknife. It can shed itself in this fashion to form a sixth helical bundle. During this process, these two membranes are brought close together and all the repulsive forces between normal cell membranes are overcome. Normally cell membranes have negative charge on the surface because of the phospholipid bilayer, that can be overcome by the action of these uh, confirmation change of this GP41. And suddenly the virus membrane here is fused with the target host cell membrane. And the virus genome is now essentially within the cytoplasm. It's in the same compartment. So you can see if we can block any of these steps, you can block virus entry. So this entry is different from what Dr. Harish was talking about. This is the entry at the cellular level, not at the organism level. So here is um, the GP41 again, the two heptad repeats. And this is the, it goes from this step to this stage. 
It, this is the, it formed the six helical bundle here. So during this step, the fusion happens. If you find other peptides that can bind to these heptide repeats, it can block this step. So this, it becomes inactive. So we have many uh, such drugs already available for HIV and we can use it. We, they're also now starting to find similar drugs for coronavirus. You can imagine, you can take heptide repeat and put it in solution after certain modification and that itself might come and bind to these molecules. So, so from one coronavirus to another coronavirus, they are already trying this. Now we'll switch gears and talk about severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, SARS-CoV. So you can see this has some features similar to HIV. So it has all these peplomers, very large peplomers. It's very easy to see in negative stain on electron microscope. And this looks like a crown. That's why the virus is called a coronavirus. And this virus, you can see lots of it within the intracellular vacuoles, cytoplasmic vacuoles, tons of these. And the virus also has the RNA. It's covered by nucleocapsid protein. So that's inside. And it has several other proteins, which we don't need for this talk. Membrane protein, and there is an E protein or envelope protein. We are concerned with this big protein called the spike protein. So again, in the spike protein, you see it has uh, the heptide repeat. It has two subunits, the S1 subunit, which binds to the receptor and the S2 subunit, which has the fusion peptide and heptide repeat. In this figure, it's showing only one heptide repeat. In actuality, this also has two heptide repeats and looks exactly similar in uh, schematic to the HIV one. And there is a cytoplasmic domain below this. So this virus is RNA virus, but it replicates in a totally different way. And this is a very big RNA virus. It's 30 kilobases long, while well, HIV is only about 10 kilobases. Two thirds of this virus is nothing but the replication machinery. It's coded in uh, ORF1 or open reading frame 1A, open reading frame 1B. And there are only four proteins in the virus. That is the envelope, uh, the E protein, the M protein, and the nucleocapsid or N protein. Rest of it are accessory proteins or non-structural proteins required in the replication of this virus. So this virus does all its job in the cytoplasm and it uses its own replicase transcription machinery. And this is the positive sense RNA virus. So this RNA, RNA can be initially used directly in, on the ribosomes to code for these two proteins. Notice again, the 1A and 1B are in two different reading frames. And usually the ribosome only goes to the end of one reading frame and stops in eukaryotic cells. It doesn't then go to an internal open reading frame. So again, this virus has to use the ribosomal frame shifting to go for this and this protein. There is a protease called M-PRO, main protease within this protein, just like an HIV. That will cleave it into all these different subunits to produce the replication transcription machinery. And this protein, in turn, then through a complex process, create a nested set of RNAs. In each RNA, the major open reading frame that needs to synthesize the protein is comes in coded here. So you see, it corresponds to these open reading frames here. So again, like HIV, the virus binds to its receptor. We'll go more into this receptor later. The fusion doesn't happen at the plasma membrane. It happens within endosomes where pH can become low. Low pH endosomes is where the fusion actually occurs for this virus. This is similar to what we see for influenza virus. So the low pH is uh, what people thought they can block by using chloroquine. Chloroquine raises the pH in the endosome. Therefore, they thought we can use this for coronavirus. But it's very hard to raise the pH of these endosomes in vivo. 
In cell culture, it works readily, and we have used this method to study other viruses, such as the respiratory syncytial virus. So where we can show increasing the pH doesn't affect respiratory syncytial virus, but it affects uh, another virus, rabies-like virus, called rhabdovirus, called VSVG. So once the fusion happens, there's unpotting, initial translation, then synthesis of all these uh, different subset of RNAs, uh, this special features of this because it's a positive sense virus to make this uh, different molecules. It has to make negative sense first and copy that. I mean, but we will not get into that. All we'll say is it makes all the different proteins through subset of uh, nested set of RNAs. These come together on the ER and through modification of the protein, surface proteins, the glyco uh, glycosylation in the Golgi. It buds into intracellular uh, vesicles and then egresses out. This again is to show that the fusion part, the S2 subunit is very similar to what we saw in HIV. So the, here is uh, both S1 and S2 together. They meet the membrane. Uh, the two membranes are brought together by the S1 subunit by binding to its receptor through the receptor binding domain. And then the S2 submit, uh, subunit can then do its job. It inserts itself into the opposing bilayer, then jackknifes on itself, and then the fusion happens. So this is the last section of my talk. Excuse me, I'm running a little late. So this is just to tell you how rapidly this virus was uh, detected within, within the weeks of description of the disease, the virus was already sequenced and isolated. So we'll have to do this more frequently in the future as more and more viruses start emerging from animals they spread to humans. So most of the patients came with non-specific. You couldn't tell which virus it was or which pathogen was causing. They had respiratory symptoms such as cough, shortness of breath, uh, they had altered taste and smell, and they had fever, and, and then they had low lymphocyte counts and low platelets and increased uh, inflammatory molecules such as C-reactive protein. So these were the symptoms. And in one of the papers, they looked at all these patients. ICU, I guess, stands for uh, intensive care unit and the patient numbers, 0, 1 through 10. They were both males and females. The earliest one in this uh, onset of disease was on December 12th. And then others were up to December 20th or 23rd. So these were all set up patients. So when you look at a radiograph of this, either CT or X-ray, you will see this patchy infiltrates in the lungs. You can see how hazy it is here. So you cannot tell what organism produced this when you get this. You have to rule out everything. And if you look at a classical textbook in medicine, there's a whole bunch of bacteria and viruses which can produce this kind of symptoms. So before you say it's a new virus, you have to rule out all these other viruses. And now we have the technology to quickly rule out other viruses by using a technique called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. I'm sorry, this uh, slide looks a little faded out, but I uh, hope you can see. So in this case, they look, uh, using PCR, looked for following organism, flu A, two types of flu B, adenovirus, and bacteria. It's a chlamydia pneumonia. Uh, so they use specific primers to amplify sequences specific for these pathogens. So when you do a PCR, you need a positive control to make sure the assay works. So they always included one well or a couple of wells containing the actual target sequence for those primers in the form of DNA. So when you do this example for flu A, this, uh, this is the PCR cycle, number of cycles it takes. So in each step or each cycle, the number of target molecules doubles if it is present because of polymerase chain reaction. And after a certain number of cycles, threshold cycles, it will start becoming visible for the 
detector through fluorescence it can tell if the molecule is amplifying and it amplifies in a logarithmic fashion every cycle so in this case the flu a positive control it raised and increased at i can't see the cycle number but let's say it's around uh, 16 or 17 it rose rapidly but the patient sample was essentially flat even for 40 cycles usually you don't go beyond 40 or 45 uh, 35 to 40 cycles of pcr amplification and you can see in all these different uh, organisms the patient sample was negative and the uh, PCR worked in every case because the positive control showed a signal, nice signal. And the place where this PCR signal starts depends on how many copies are present. So it takes a while. If fewer copies are present, it takes longer number of cycles before you can start seeing it. And if there are very many copies, you can start seeing it earlier. So you can see some difference between these different uh, samples showing that they didn't start with uh, equal number of copies of target molecules in the PCR reaction. So the way to figure out a new pathogen is to use the next generation sequencing. Many labs have this. I think it's also spread to many places in India. So first you have to prepare a library of molecules in the, from the patient sample of DNA or RNA you make a library from that, then you sequence it and then analyze the sequence. So all these can happen because nowadays we have kits. We use the kits to generate these libraries. So in this case, uh, the library preparation, people are looking at the RNA because they suspected it was something like a RNA virus. So they took the entire RNA, they got from a sample from a lavage of the bronchial tree. So you put in some fluid into the trachea and suck it back out. It's called bronchioalveolar lavage. And then you isolate the RNA from it. So there will be cells from cellular RNA, there will be viral RNA, there will be bacterial RNA, and you make a library. During the library construction, you put special uh, linkers and barcodes to, when you make this library. And then you use this for what is called amplification, cluster amplification. These are fixed in parts of this slide, and then amplification occurs. You don't need to go into detail, but once you have a cluster of the same molecule amplified multiple times, and then you sequence these clusters, then each time a nucleotide which is fluorescently tagged binds in during the synthesis, it can be read by the instrument. And based on the color, you can say it's the G, T, C, or A. And you, these are usually very short reads, around 200, and you can align them. And you'll see all these aligned sequences. These are the reads. And then multiple such reads can be put together and you can generate the whole sequence genome. And this sequence was uh, determined and published uh, through uh, and put in a database. And people heard of this even before the papers came out. On January 10th, it was announced. We have isolated this new virus. It is still in a draft state. Please use this to develop kits for diagnosis of this virus or try to find solutions, cures for this virus. So this is one of the papers. So here's what happened when they did uh, this library and sequenced it. Most of the sequences uh, map to SARS-related coronavirus, most of the reads. The others picked other organisms. This is interesting to go into, but we don't have time, so we will not delve into it. And if, if you analyze the sequence with a computer, you can read, find out which are the open reading frames, and it looks very much like the previous coronavirus uh, they had identified. It had uh, open reading frame 1A, 1B, spike protein, envelope protein, M protein, and nucleocapsid protein, and other non-structural proteins. So once you have the sequence, you have to find out which is it closely related, which coronavirus is most closely related to. And that is shown in this uh, C, figure C. The closer it is related, that is it gets closer to 100% identity or uh, similarity for each nucleotide, it comes as this horizontal line. Where it differs, it, it, the line 
deviates from this horizontal uh, line. The actual line for this is actually 100% straight line. The closest one they could get is from this bad coronavirus, which is called bad COVID RATG13. Nothing to do with rats, but that is the nomenclature. This Wuhan Institute of Virology gave this particular coronavirus. The other bad coronaviruses were quite dissimilar, less than 70% or 80% uh, similarity. There were big divergences, as you can expect in the spike protein and in the replicase protein here, this part. You can see this coronavirus, which is similar to a bad coronavirus, is far away from other human coronaviruses people previously identified. The ones that cause common cold or the MERS or the original SARS virus. There is, they are related, but the distance is rather great. And this suggested this is a new set of coronavirus, new coronavirus. And this is five of these sequences from five individual samples from different people that were isolated. Those were all 99.9% .9 similar to each other. And they were 96% similar to this bat coronavirus. That's how this virus was dis discovered. So not only they got the sequence, they were able to grow this virus. So they knew earlier that SARS virus can grow in the monkey kidney cell line, African green monkey kidney cell line, and that had the receptor. So they were able to grow this virus and it produces what's called cytopathic effect that Dr. Harish talked about. It looks distinctly different, normal and infected look different from each other. And you can look for a, an antigen in this infected cells. Many, some of the proteins are quite similar to proteins in other coronavirus. For example, the nucleocapsid protein, the sequences are very similar. Antibody to nucleocapsid protein from one coronavirus can usually bind to another coronavirus. And in this case, it did bind. The blue color is a non-specific stain for DNA or host nucleus. So this shows the blue cells. There are a lot of blue cells in this field. And some of the cells are infected and uh, there is some lysis of cells you can see. And these are stained red for the nucleocapsid protein. If you do a cryo, I mean, you can the thin section and look at the electron microscopy, you can see intracellular vacuoles and a blow up of this shows something that looks like coronavirus here. So once they also discovered what is the receptor for this virus. So they suspected it was the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which was also the one for uh, original SARS virus, SARS-CoV. And it also grew in the same cell line. So what they did, they took a different cell called HeLa cell and genetically modified to express angiotensin converting enzyme 2. They also tried several other uh, receptors known for other coronaviruses. The one that produces common cold uses amino peptidase. There's still others which use dipeptidyl peptidase. So they individually, that is in separate culture, transfected these cells with the DNA encoding these three uh, proteins or the cells were left unmodified. All these proteins, when they express in the genomic level, they put a little tag, it's called the S tag. So they can use the same antibody to detect the expression. So if you use the anti S tag monoclonal antibody labeled with FITSI, all this, uh, the positive uh, receptor expressing cells light up green. And the ones that are infected by the virus subsequently, you can stain for the nucleocapsid protein labeled with a different color. In this case, this is a red color, this is green, the nuclei are stained with blue. You merge them all together and you get this picture. And there is co-localization of cells which are expressing this receptor, ACE2 receptor and nucleocapsid, some of them here. But the other receptor bearing HeLa cells were not infected. You don't see any red color at all, and neither in the control. So that's how they discovered which in the, uh, molecule on the cell surface was the receptor for this virus. 
not only did they do that they found that the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is the receptor they looked at this enzyme from different species so they looked at ace2 from human bat swine civet and mouse all the top four were allowed the replication of the virus but the mouse one did not so what can we say from this mouse cannot be an intermediate host for sars cov2 because it cannot allow the replication of this virus so let's summarize what i've mentioned and we'll conclude the talk in the next few minutes so we have hiv and sars cov the gene on both of them have a single stranded genome this is only about 10 kilobases and the sars cov is 30 kilobases so three of these can fit into one sars cov the fusion or entry of this virus occurs at the plasma membrane for hiv and it it occurs in the low pH endosome of SARS-CoV. Characteristic enzyme for HIV is the reverse transcriptase. It's a RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. And the enzyme for this SARS-CoV is RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is synthesized for most RNA viruses. They have some type of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. The replication is distinct for these two viruses. In HIV, it is first reverse transcribed into the host cell genome. In SARS-CoV, all the activity happens in the cytoplasm. The transcription of the genome, uh, integrated uh, virus in the genome, that is a provirus. This virus is very clever. It just uses the host cell RNA polymerase too. In the case of SARS-CoV, it has to carry this baggage, this huge open reading frames, two open reading frames for replication of this virus in the cytoplasm. They also differ in how they assemble and mature. In HIV, the assembly is usually the plasma membrane in T lymphocytes, but in another target cell, intra, uh, macrophages, it buds into intracellular vesicles. For SARS-CoV, it burns into intracellular vesicles. There are some similarities between two, these two viruses. Both of them use ribosomal frame shifting to generate fusion proteins. These polyproteins are then cleaved by virally encoded proteases. So good drug targets, which are distinct from cellular proteases. And they also use host proteases for their maturation. The envelope glycoprotein matures for both of these using host proteases. In SARS-CoV, there is one protein for while the virus is budding out of the cell, another cellular protein which further modifies the S2 subunit for fusion to occur. Both of these viruses are zoonosis, that is, they came from animal reservoir. Clinical disease is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome versus severe acute respiratory syndrome. Uh, respiratory syndrome. So, Lenti virus means long and slow virus. So this clinical disease is very long for AIDS. From the, from the time of infection to getting the AIDS symptoms, it can go on for up to 10 years before you know what is happening to you. For SARS-CoV, you get exposed to the infection from another person. Within a week or two, at the most, you will come down with symptoms if you have severe disease or you will recover it is sometimes unbeknownst to you that you are infected so that, that's the difference between them. so what can we say that scientific community has accomplished they isolated virus from patients identified initial source of virus possibly wet market in wuhan but they made a mistake here they didn't sample the animals in that market directly. They just looked at some surfaces in the market and they showed that the virus sequence was there. So they missed an opportunity to find the intermediate host. They sequenced the genome and deposited in record time in public database. They identified the receptor. Structures of key viral proteins already elucidated. The spike protein, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, main protease. I'll just show you one slide of what has been accomplished. They have even isolated monoclonal antibodies from 
or generated unidentified neutralizing monoclonal antibodies from infected people. So combination of this may be useful in therapy. Many different vaccines are being generated, recombinant vaccines. Now we know the sequence, we can use different strategies to express these proteins for vaccines without causing disease. Vaccine is to have exposed the body to the virus without producing disease. So the challenges are we need to find the intermediate host. We need to identify drug targets. Can we find a fusion inhibitor? Can we find a drug that binds to the replicates? Remdesivir is a spelling error. There should be an I here. And then protease inhibitors. So scientists have been hard at work. Here is the, they have identified an, uh, what's called a fusion inhibitor targeting the HR domain of human coronavirus spikes. This is not for uh, SARS-CoV-2, but they found a fusion inhibitor that works against other types of coronaviruses. I don't know if they have tested it against SARS-CoV-2. So it works against uh, uh, MERS, SARS, and even the common cold causing coronavirus. And this peptide is shown in green here. It's a very tiny, so I just wanted to briefly show you there are two types of images. One is showing the uh, amino acids as a helical structure. This one is like surface representation of the same molecule. Then we have a protease inhibitor has been identified that binds to SARS-CoV-2 main protease. This is alpha ketoamide. This looks very promising. Uh, you. This can be, they have tested it in mice and found that high concentrations of this drug is present in the lungs. And it, it works quite well for SARS-CoV-2. We have to see further modifications to improve its efficacy and safety has to be tested. And lastly, we already know they are testing Remdesivir, which was actually developed for uh, MERS coronavirus. They found that it works in cell culture and they showed where it binds to this, uh, river, uh, to this RNA dependent RNA polymerase. It's somewhere here, very hard to see in this picture. Even if you squint, you cannot see it. So you, knowing the structure, you can design other drugs that will bind here and prevent elongation of this RNA or transcription of this RNA. So we still have other challenges, drugs that target host, how to control the cytokine storm, how to enhance the innate immunity that Dr. Harish talked about. And then we need to find a safe vaccine. So this is ongoing and certain phase one and phase two trials are done and phase three is in progress for some of these. So the moral of this lesson is we have to put in place systems and practices at a national and international level to get in front of the next pandemic. You see, China has done really good. Within a month, they were able to identify, sequence, and they even started testing some uh, possible uh, solutions against this uh, virus, therapeutic solutions. They made some vaccines, all in record time, less than six months. And the whole international community of scientists is involved in, in this endeavor. So I'll end it with this uh, thanks to all the frontline healthcare providers public health professionals and scientists for their efforts at tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. All the best to them. And thank you all for a patient hearing and happy Ganesh Chaturthi. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Kiran to thank the speaker. Good evening to one and all. On behalf of uh, entire fraternity of Mahajan Education Society, I convey deep regards and thankful to respected and distinguished speaker of the today's webinar, Dr. Srinivas N. Kumar, Professor and Research Associate, Department of Internal Medicine, St. Louis University, USA, who inspired us through a motivational talk on a tale of two pandemics, that is HIV versus COVID-19. He told us, 
the importance of uh, history of major pandemics comparison between hiv and uh, covid 19 and its treatment uh, and uh, origin and mode of transmission of uh, corona uh, virus 19 it is very interesting molecular link between hiv and covid 19 and uh, potential drugs used for hiv and covid 19 which has to be identified and uh, rapid identification protocol which was identified uh, of covid 19 sir thank you very much for making this webinar interesting and fruitful we all inspired us inspired by your great words thank you very much sir thank you very much now the session is open for the discussion uh, we have some questions which is raised by the uh, participants uh, one of the question uh, from jayjita kanna uh, which is says that ac2 receptor is present in all the cell types like liver gastrointestinal uh, tract etc but why covid 19 infect ac2 receptor only in lungs question so, to dr let's take this question so um it, see different coronaviruses can affect different uh, organs and there is i know i don't think it is clearly shown that it cannot infect the other cells like uh, cardiac or uh, uh, endothelial cells not only pneumocytes whether it can infect enterocytes it's not clearly established some people have found for example the uh, rna samples in the stool others have failed to recognize this so it has the potential to infect but the uh, ability to infect enterocytes means it has to survive the gastrointestinal fluids it may not be able to survive that so bile salts and others can inactivate the virus so it chooses the one it can infect okay there is one more question sir from nirupam malakar how long a pandemic uh, this covid 19 is going to last sir so this is based on the basic reproduction rate so if you can bring it down either with drugs or vaccine to less than one then the pandemic stops if you have a large susceptible population the pandemic will continue so right now initially there was a good uh, transmission control by lockdown india did a rapid lockdown it was able to control the infection to great extent we had to keep it going for a little while longer but uh, political exigencies made people give up on this lockdown sooner than required so one way is if you prevent spread of virus from one person to another by a strict quarantine lockdown and uh, contact tracing you can control the virus china has shown it can work they have been uh, able to control it to a great extent each time a new case pops up you have to immediately hammer it and catch that person and all the contacts and if you do this effectively and everybody wears a mask and does hand washing it can be controlled but uh, this is hard to do when there is a large population so people are trying to find uh, either a vaccine or a drug so just like for hiv if you give the drug you can control the pandemic only people who cannot afford the drugs will get the disease thank you sir there is one more question uh, from raghavendra agadkatte uh, whether we can target rna replicase or it may have an impact on telomerase i don't know the answer to that question it's a good question i don't know how closely they are related the telomerase enzyme and this uh, replicates in the virus and if you look at the structure and the active site and then you should be able to decide you can select drugs that target one versus another i'm not an expert in this area so i cannot say definitively but it should be possible to identify <laughs> drugs which are particular to rna replicates of coronavirus okay so i think uh, telomerase is uh... dna dependent rna polymerase no sir 
No sir, it's RNA dependent enzyme only. ప్రొడక్షన్ ఆఫ్ ఇంట్రోఫెరాన్ is innate immunity or adaptive immunity so adaptive means it uh, is based on t cells and b cells so this is non specific immunity i think dr harish will be able to answer this question uh, yeah as i said it is not virus specific so it is uh, part of the innate immunity yes and uh, uh, it is uh, only host cell specific and like i mean either uh, anti viral substances it is also a, a part of the innate immunity okay sir uh, yes, one sir. more question sir uh, for shrinivas sir is it possible to block a slippery position in order to produce the formation of gag or gag pro uh theoretically it is possible i haven't looked uh, well into the literature to see if they found any molecules um there might be some that i'm not aware of okay so uh one question from shahajeb uh for uh, harish sir uh why hepatitis c virus is danger than hiv which i yeah. <laughs> is more communicable at the same time and it is uh, the outcome of hepatitis uh, c virus is more dangerous it may result in hepatocellular carcinoma okay so if any participants if have any questions uh, you can just ask they can post it in the chat box uh, uh one more question sir from nirupam how plasma therapy controls the spread of virus in the body to whom anybody can take sir anybody can take <laughs> i'm thinking they are they are talking about people who have recovered from the infection yes sir yes sir. and they have uh, antibodies against the virus yeah so you can it's like giving anti serum to the virus uh so one of the issues is even though you have antibodies you can also have circulating virus also sometimes so you should be careful when you do plasma therapy uh but they have already isolated uh, monoclonal antibodies that can neutralize the virus they can use combinations instead of plasma therapy plasma therapy may have other reasons for giving i am not aware of uh, right now like control some things happening in the plasma thank you sir kind of active immune therapy uh, using the antibodies that are raised against covid 19 itself um possibly as uh, dr sinwa said uh, one should be careful uh, for uh, as far as plasma therapy is concerned because anything excess injected into individual in the form of antibodies that are already there uh, it may cause serious um, uh, consequences uh, uh dr kumar it's uh, it may trigger of even death if the uh, extent of antibodies pushed into the recipient is too much yeah i'm not sure it depends on the antibody and what it does yeah depends on what other uh, whether it activate complement when it binds to the antigen yeah There are so many issues involved so i'm sure people who have done the anti serum therapy kind of know how much to give for body weight correct but uh, it, it, so will, it, it uh, will definitely induce serum sickness serum sickness is induced yeah, with the yeah. input of antibodies in large quantities yes so they have to carefully monitor monitor that yes that is why it's better to get purified antibodies 
which hmm. is characterized and know exactly how much you're giving. In plasma, yes. it is uh, difficult to characterize. You usually pull plasma or something they use from a lot of individuals. Exactly. It work in an emergency. Uh, early case of Ebola virus and others, there was no cure available. And they used, very few patients survived from Ebola. So they could take these people's uh, plasma or serum and give it to other individuals to help them recover. It can be life-saving, but uh, the experts should handle this. Like you said. Uh, what's the situation with regard to monoclonal antibodies against COVID-19? So from uh, people itself, they have isolated the B cells and isolated those uh, monoclonal antibodies. They have characterized which epitope on the S1 or S2 subunit it binds to. And they have found combinations which are very effective in vitro at blocking the virus entry. So these may be useful when given to very sick patients. So may be useful. So we have to see. You have to do clinical trials to find the efficacy of these antibodies. Is it in the pipeline? Clinical trials are in the pipeline? I don't know. I have to look. There is a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Mm. Uh, if you go to that website, you will be able to see all the trials. There are more than 2,000 trials for uh, COVID going on right now. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, due to the constraint in time, uh, we'll wind the discussion part. Now, I request uh, our CEO and academic advisor, Dr. S. R. Ramesh, to conclude the remarks on this uh, webinar. Over to you, mm -hmm. sir. Before uh, Dr. Ramesh takes over, can I make yeah, please, Dr. Hoti. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Harish talk was like uh, refreshing, and Dr. Kumar's uh, talk was like for me replenishing. They were very both were very useful. I hope for the participants must have enjoyed it. A uh, couple of questions to Dr. Kumar. Uh, you presented first two papers on uh, HIV. Then uh, there was, you know, from uh, two, 2013 to 15 or so. I mean, 2003 to 8, or the discovery of HIV virus. 83, from, yeah, 83, 84. 80, 80, 80, 80. Yeah, they started off with uh, Carina infection, and then they uh, went on to discover the HIV. What made them to think of a viral infection in those uh, co-infections? Oh, for a, in the AIDS patients? Yeah. So one of the things was these people had, uh, initially they would have flu-like symptoms and enlarged lymph nodes they would see. Then they saw the T cells yes. were de decreasing in these patients. So it was something that was killing off the T cells. It was a lymphotropic virus. And the people are working on uh, viruses that affect the lympho lymphocytes. This is Dr. Robert Gallo's group. And there are some people in France, Barry Sinozzi and others who are working on this aspect where they were sus they just suspected uh, there was a, it was a haunch, it was a virus because they couldn't isolate any bacteria or other organisms at that time. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kumar. Nice uh, listening to you, a very informative lecture. Yeah, then go ahead. Okay, if there are no more questions. Uh, Ramesh, sir. Yeah. Concluding remarks can be go ahead, sir. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, see, uh, it's my privilege to just wind up the entire webinar with a couple of remarks or observations. Uh, the uh, the observations made by Dr. Hoti has lessened my burden uh, <laughs> regarding both the speakers of today. Actually, I would also would like to disclose that uh, 
basically dr harish and dr sinwas kumar uh, they are doctors mbbs md phd so i uh, I, i see a few people very few people who are doctors getting into research and also teaching rather they would prefer for for a practice uh, life uh, well their their services to to society is also required but these are the got enthused with uh, the science behind uh, what is happening why it is happening and so forth dr harish uh, uh, has been a very um, uh, proficient uh, uh, teacher at jipmar and also he is into uh, research for over decades well now uh, he is free and that's how i i could uh, catch him uh, for a while and uh, i would like to thank him for his presence over here and uh, providing uh, a very basic foundation on on virology and uh, aspects uh, several aspects of uh, virus thank you uh, subsequently uh, dr sinwas kumar took over uh, the platform and uh, uh, dr sinwas kumar also has similar kind of uh, academic accomplishments of uh, being mbbs md phd and uh, got into research and teaching uh, abroad uh, well uh, such bright scientists um, india last but anyway he is doing a very good job and uh, dr sinwas kumar uh, actually narrated uh, uh, the whole lot of uh, information with regard to both hiv and uh, uh, covid well basically i would like to tell uh, dr sinwas kumar uh, has done lot of research uh, using hiv genome as such uh, for various applications so that's how he was so authoritative in describing every bit of it and then uh, bringing it to our notice finally the message he could deliver to the participants is and the young people who are uh, who are planning for future career is that there is a lot to do uh, as far as um, viral molecular biology and viral uh, research is concerned so it's a opportunity for most of the people who would like to pursue their career and also uh, academic uh, pursuits in terms of uh, basic research as well as applied research dr sinwas kumar also uh, disclosed uh, the strategies uh, how we can uh, employ to to control an infection or to prevent an infection and so on and so forth uh, and up to date uh, information with regard to the availability of drugs vaccines and the therapies with regard to the covid so with this uh, uh, few uh, closing remarks uh, i would like to thank him i would like to thank both the uh, uh, resource persons and i would like to thank all the participants who have derived the benefit of today's webinar and uh, uh, for the participants i would like to inform that we are planning a couple of more webinars from experts like this and uh, information will be sent to you uh because we have your emails and if you are interested you can please join us thank you so much i thank uh, majana education society for supporting all the all the endeavors uh, what we are taking up i also thank the program coordinators for making this uh, webinar successful well this has become a kind of uh, formal vote of thanks but personally as a ceo of uh, majanas college i would like to thank all these personnel including tejasvi and uh, uh, the our uh, uh, head of the department of journalism ravi and uh, system admin uh, uh, mr manjunath thank you so much all of you have a nice day thank, thank you. you for making it possible very thank good you, sir thank you. thank you very much uh, for your concluding uh, remarks uh, the webinar is now going to be in an end session uh, now i would like to uh, propose a vote of thanks uh, <laughs> on behalf of department of life sciences pooja bhagwat memorial mahajana 
postgraduate center i take this opportunity to propose this sort of thanks i extend my hearty thanks to our resource persons uh, dr shrinivas n kumar and dr b n arish for accepting our invitation and to deliver this talk in this webinar and sharing their immense knowledge in a lucid manner thank you sir thank you very much thank you i on behalf of department of life science i thank our president shri muralidhar bagwat and our honorable secretary dr vijay lakshmi bagwat for supporting and encouraging us in organizing this event thank you sir thank you madam i also thank our governing council members i immensely thank our director dr c k renukarya and our ceo dr s r ramesh as well as the principal dr jay kumari for their unstinted support in organizing this kind of events that forms an impetus for all of us thank you to all thank you i thank mr manjunath and ravi ayer of journalism department for providing us their studio to conduct this webinar and to run in a smooth manner thank you sir i thank all my colleagues of life science department for their support to make this event success i thank the technical person mr tejasvi for streaming this webinar online i thank all the participants and the delegates who have participated from various places i thank one and all who have made this webinar a grand success thank you now a link of uh, feedback form will be sent to the whatsapp group i request all the participants to fill the feedback form and the time gap of around 45 minutes will be provided for them and after that it's going to be freezed so the participants whoever going to be submit their feedback form 